Good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark, and I am the director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy. And you've tuned into uh, the Open Classroom, which tonight uh, we'll be talking about a wonderful project, a, a Brunner Foundation award winner in New Orleans. And uh, I was prevailed upon by the folks in New Orleans uh, to uh, put on my New Orleans look. So um, here I am. Uh, with that introduction, we don't have any uh, logistical uh, uh, matters to discuss tonight. Um, and so I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Anne-Marie Lubinow from uh, the Brunner Foundation. Anne-Marie, you're on. Okay, thank you, Ted. Good evening, everybody. My name is Anne-Marie Lupinow, and I'm the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. For those of you who don't know us, the Rudy Bruner Award is a national urban design award that recognizes transformative places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of American cities. Since 1987, the Rudy Bruner Award, or RBA as we refer to it, has recognized 88 places across the US and shared their stories with detailed case studies that are available on our website. And over the course of the spring 2021 Myra Craft Open Classroom, we're tapping into this network of award-winning places to explore how cities across America are addressing challenges through design. So tonight's session, we're gonna explore how engaging and empowering the next generation is helping to build inclusive and vibrant communities in New Orleans and Boston. We're gonna learn about Parasite Skate Park in New Orleans, as Ted mentioned, a 2019 Rudy Bruner Award silver medalist. And it's the do-it-yourself creation of a new public skate park below a highway overpass. And the project was made possible through a collaborative partnership with the Albert and Tina Small Center for Collaborative Design at Tulane University that leveraged their skills and the skills of the institution's faculty, students, staff, and community. And we're also going to learn about how Youth Build Boston is using community-engaged design practices to build the capacity of people, communities, and the next generation of designers here in Boston. So tonight's presenters include Ann Yoakum, the director of the Small Center and professor of practice at the Tulane School of Architecture, or as she likes to refer to herself, a constant brainstormer who fosters collaboration in everything she does. And at the Small Center, she supports meaningful change through research and interdisciplinary collaboration, including partnerships with other university departments, local and national organizations, design practitioners, and communities. She'll be uh, joined by Julian Wellis, a former co-director of Transitional Spaces, an independent nonprofit organization that aims to provide safe and accessible skate parks for all users by fostering a positive and nurturing community. In his role at Transitional Spaces, Julian worked to legalize, expand, and maintain Parasite Skate Park, the city of New Orleans' first and only skate park. And we have Michael Chavez, who's the project development manager for Youth Build Boston. His role includes oversight of affordable housing, community service projects and engagement, and youth programs. And prior to joining Youth Build, Michael was an Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellow and worked with the Boston-based Fairmont Indigo Line CDC Collaborative to advance a smart growth agenda along the nine mile commuter rail line. Uh, in tonight's format, we're going to take a slightly different approach from the previous sessions, and we're actually building upon a brainstorming idea of Anne's. We're going to start with brief presentations from Anne, Julian, and Michael about their respective programs and projects. Then we'll kick off the Q&A period with the three of them asking each other a question before turning to the audience. So I'm sure this will be an engaging, an engaging evening. So now I will turn this over to Anne, Julian, and Michael. Take it away. And you need to unmute. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, Here we go. I apologize, just wanted to make sure. Well, I just first wanna say thank you to the Northeastern School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, the Meyercraft Open Classroom, the Bruner Foundation and the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence um, for inviting us to be here and to be able, Julian and I are so excited to share the story of Parasite with you. 
Um, and Julian and I did decide, uh, it was our collective idea to do this brainstorm um, and share. And we decided to go back and forth uh, because it's a story we are telling. So bear with us in the Zoom times if there are any you know, Zoom issues or technical issues. So Parasite is a story of infrastructure designed to divide, reimagine to bring us together. It's a story of a void turned into a vibrant public space. It's a story of a project shaping city policy, a story of design process building power. But it's also a story of challenges, the limitations of what cities are able and willing to do, multiple jurisdictions at play, the realities of what it means to be a volunteer run organization. And as always, it raises questions of funding. But most importantly, Parasite is a story of people. Um, thank you so much, Anne. I've had such a nice time the past couple of days working on this with you. Um, this is the first public skate park in New Orleans. This is what it looked like in 2008. First thing I want to say is that there were no rules. If this was going to be the place that we created, what did we want that to look like? Everything was just this blank canvas that was constantly getting overlaid and overlaid. Skate ramps built by skateboarders. We just wanted a concrete ramp to skate. The peach orchard was kind of an experiment. <laughs> organic. It, was, it just happened. The people that were involved in building it were also the people that used the space. There was every age of person, every background, every interest. I sat there and looked down on this and I thought, this is like a little Eden. I mean, this was obviously a utopian project. The place we always dreamed of. Yeah. I think I might see a good cinder block. Yeah, Allie gets this phone call and it's the Picho is knocked down. It, it was a morning, I got a text that said, they are bulldozing the skate park right now. And I jumped in my van and I uh, drove up there, breakneck speed, and I just wandered around the ruins with all these other kind of traumatized people who looked like they were sleepwalking. There was a crater, a huge, crater in the ground, like an explosion had taken place. I felt pretty sad because I knew what an asset it was. First thing I want to say is... So, um, what did we do after that happened? We just moved directly across the street and did the exact same thing. For some reason, I don't know why, expecting different results. Um, this time, it was under the Interstate 610, and it's on a 45,000 square foot slab. Um, again, zero funding zero permission, the city tells us to stop immediately. And coincidentally, or somewhat planned, at the same time we applied to work with the Small Center. The skaters approached Small Center for technical assistance in protecting the park and design assistance in continuing its build out. Small Center's work began with capacity building, helping the skaters form Transitional Spaces, the nonprofit organization that serves a steward of the space. Through this, the skaters were able to negotiate with city officials to declare the site an official skate park and secure a set of ramps donated to the city by Red Bull and Spawn Ranch. Community engagement sessions and charrettes helped inform a master plan to ensure the park's long-term success, which included designs for an entrance, native vegetation, and seating elements. Planted areas addressed the need for stormwater catchment and filtration from the skate park and highway overpass, reducing the burden on the city's infrastructure. Small Center then constructed the entryway and commissioned signage to physically reframe the park 
educate on stormwater management, and provide official recognition of the space. The first official skate park in New Orleans, Parasite demonstrates how forgotten infrastructure projects of the past can become vibrant spaces for collective futures. The Skaters Approach Small Center. I wanted to highlight a few specific things from that uh, video. So the small center, uh, the work that we did spanned only a year. And so we are telling a story um, that has yet to be finished of the skate park. And so our work uh, included a design build studio that actually had no design build in it. Um, it was planning and prototyping and um, capacity building. Um, a summer where transitional spaces and the small center waited for approval. And and then also a seminar where uh, the building actually occurred. Beyond skaters and the Tulane faculty and staff and the small center staff that were involved, this work included artists, lawyers, concrete specialists, just to name a few. The importance of the skate park goes beyond uh, the site itself. The entry served as a needed reference point and a pilot project at a key mo moment um, in the city's history as we were looking at uh, new stormwater management for the comprehensive zoning ordinances. In the same vein, the focus on uh, that Ali Broussard, who you heard in the video said, um, on creating a park for skaters and not a skate park, created an opportunity for us to think about climate resilience differently, thinking about social networks across age, class, race. At the same time, bringing together people for community engagement, girl skate nights, prototyping, on-site uh, activities, DJs, offered an opportunity to serve as a model for how we design inclusive public spaces moving forward. But perhaps most importantly, the small center's work left transitional spaces with a plan that we had co-created together. Um, we were able to harness the momentum that we gained from the small center and our new skill sets. And after we parted ways, we've been able to independently design, fundraise, and complete two major phase builds. Um, we've done a lot of smaller builds based off of um, grants and other community partnerships. We've continued to develop the green spaces. We've also created a design. This is from the park's official opening, which was kind of our closing with the small center, which was a ribbon cutting that we held with the mayor of New Orleans. Um, just to kind of show you more of the vibe, both Anne and I are in love with that child on the left, but the photo on the right is our first phase build we did after leaving the small center and it tied in their entrance to the existing infrastructure that we had initially built illegally. Um, Yes, the park is legal. However, we haven't received any public funding, which is kind of a lot of what I do in my life. Um, so we remain a community funded passion project. Transitional Spaces is a 100% volunteer run organization. Um, because of that, we have to build out the park phases. Engineers and architects have donated time. Our park builders have been working with us since the beginning of legal thing and they've been so generous. Um, we pay them, but so generous. Um, on your left is this daiquiri lid skate sculpture. We have a lot of trash that builds up. We clean up the trash every Saturday, but we decided we got some grants from both the Black Rocks Arts Foundation and the Platforms Fund. And we decided to turn the trash into a skatable feature. That thing was later galvanized, which was very cool. Our other main fundraising, our other main way of gaining funds is through crowdsourcing. So we've ran three Kickstarters, um, two Kickstarters and one GoFundMe and raised over $100,000. Part of it is having a really great team who makes great videos, um, a lot of good branding. Parasite is also a brand as well as a park, which is an asset. And then we have a really big Instagram following, which helps a lot. It's a community project. Um, as far as design, 
Everything is co-designed, so we get input from park users. This was a design session from about a year ago, planning for our upcoming builds, which we need to fundraise for, um, which will be a street plaza. Part of what we take into consideration are different skaters have different needs, um, transition versus street style elements, and also varying skill levels. In designing the park, chalk is your best friend because you can design something on paper, but until you actually get to the space and map things out, you have no idea how the elements are gonna interact. Um, beyond um, designing infrastructure, we also work really hard on cultivating an atmosphere. Ali Bruiser and Jackson had this idea of psychic gardening, which is kind of like a holistic approach to design. Um, so the park is maintained by the skaters, which helps give them agency and create like a really positive space. This is to me what it's all about is like people being present, people learning, helping one another. It feels really good to be at the skate park and I can't show you that over Zoom, but I can only, <laughs> you have to trust me on it. Um, our greatest challenge has actually been growing transitional spaces, which is the overseeing, overseeing body of Parasite. Um, just like the small center encouraged kids to take um, a lot of agency towards helping on community projects, we lost three of our members to Landscape Architecture School for them to continue doing similar types of design. Um, and it also turns out that just you know, bureaucracy and fundraising is a lot less sexy than building a DIY park. Um, last year, luckily, Skylar and I stepped down as co-directors and Parasite has a new director, Johnny Brasley, and he's been doing like an amazing job regalvanizing community support because like this isn't what builds skate parks. Um, this is. And so just as people are the center of Parasite Skate Park, um, really, uh, and Parasite Skate Park is one project of, that the small center has worked on over the years, and people and relationships and trust are at the heart of all the small center's work. And um, over the past 15 years, we've worked with over 200 partners on 130 projects. Um, the partners have ranged like transitional spaces, nonprofit organizations, artists, construction workers, um, city agencies, um, and more recently, architecture firms. The majority of the work is like Parasite Skate Park in New Orleans. Um, but in the last two years, we've expanded to work more regionally and nationally as well. And the work ranges from graphic design advocacy, design build like Parasite Skate Park, uh, visioning for nonprofit organizations on planning, um, and even serving as an advisor to architectural firms who want to um, embed engagement in their space. At the core of all the work though, the most important thing is, um, and you can see this in the Parasite Skate Pro um, Park project, is that we believe that a collaborative design process can build coalitions and capacity to address the long standing inequity that we see in our built environment. So just like that infrastructure was designed to divide, we can create new public spaces um, that bring people together. Uh, on issues ranging from affordable housing to restorative justice, uh, our focus is always on elevating partners um, and supporting community driven ideas. And that's why Parasite Skate Park is a great example. Um, and we think it's like, I don't know, it's, it's an amazing uh, representation of what people can do um, and what we can all do together. Uh, as important as the community driven ideas is because we are a community design center based at an institution, we are trying to also train the next generation of architects and designers to think critically about their role um, in shaping the built environment. We want students to become professionals who challenge conventions on what design is, who it is for, and why it matters and what it can do. And most importantly, we want everyone to embrace this ethos, our students and our partners that we're all working together on, that each of us should be empowered to, 
to shape the places we live, work, and play. And Michael, I turn it over to you at that moment because I know that's what you're doing too. Awesome. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Julian. That was really, really good stuff, guys. I have lots of good questions for you, I think, at the end here. So I'm excited to ask you them. Um, let me share my screen. I can make this. Are you guys there? Let's see, I have a black screen on my side. Let me... While you're doing there that, let me just remind folks that if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box because uh, we want as many folks involved in this conversation as possible. Thanks. Okay, let's see, what am I sharing here? Oops. <laughs> Let me get back to my, oh, my PDF goes down there. I just go to my PowerPoint. Okay. You can at least see that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. So that should I, and you probably can see the slides on the side too, is right? Mm -hmm. Is it the rough version? Okay. So let me go to the full screen. Is this okay if I do this? Sure. Is it probably not that good because then I'm... sorry guys, I don't know what's going on here with this. Okay. Hopefully this is okay. You can see it okay with that. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, uh, and I want to thank Anne Marie for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Obviously, when she calls you, you say yes, and then you figure out what she wants at, later on. So, uh, you know, I really want to thank this entire team for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Um, you know, we're at a critical time in this country, and the conversations we're having is is more important than ever. Um, every single one of us on this call needs to find a way to make this world a better place, and it starts by simply listening, and especially those uh, who we don't know or agree with. Um, my name is Michael Chavez. I'm the project development manager and architect for Youth Build Boston. Um, uh, Youth Build Boston was established in 1990 with the, uh, and we're a nonprofit workforce development program in the building trades. And the core of our training happens to uh, live, uh, happens to be on uh, building affordable housing projects that we design, develop, and build uh, all in house. Our mission is to empower and assist underserved young people from the Boston area with the essential social, vocational, academic, and life skills necessary to navigate a positive pathway to self-sufficiency and neighborhood responsibility. Our theory of change is that young people, when empowered with the skills and education necessary to improve the quality of life, will realize that they can play a leadership role in strengthening their communities. And you know, when we say youth, it goes anywhere from 14 to 26 years of age. So when we say youth, it's kind of a large range of folks, right? Um, now, for as long as humans have been on Earth, the concept of youth has always been at the core of what we base our entire lives on. Some of us have had great childhoods, uh, sorry. Some of us have had really hard childhoods, right? Some of us were born into debt and poverty and others were born into wealth and prestige. Some of us have had parents who were well-connected and can pass that network on to their kids. While many of us have had absolutely no professional network growing up and developed one on our own. We hear descriptions of individual youth as anything from being that crazy wild child with no abilities to make smart decisions to a quiet, cautious kid who's wise beyond their years. We label kids as, oh, they're gonna be great athletes because of how balanced they walk as a toddler. Uh, or look at those eyes, you're going to have to fight off all those you know, boys and girls later on when you get older, right? By the time a young person is entering middle school or teenage years, they've had so many comments about them that they oftentimes take on those roles in a real way, while in reality, the best thing that we can do for our kids is just to let them grow and start to find out things for themselves. Youth Build Boston is an organization that works with disadvantaged youth, and although the term is commonly used in grant writing and demographic data, what we're really doing is working with young people who haven't been given the chance to find out who they really are, at least not in a safe and productive way. In a similar tone, the projects that we take on are very much the same thing. We have vacant lots, low-income schools, public infrastructure, foreclosed and abandoned properties that uh, in many ways are the mirror images of us as humans, but in built form, 
rather than in born form. I'll give you an example of our next affordable housing project that we are breaking ground on in a few months. Uh, we have literally been working on getting this project going in some form or fashion for over four years now. And two of those years have been uh, spent sitting in permitting. So you can see this half house here. Um, our community engagement process on this project has been ranged from learning more about the historic past of this structure, which it used to actually look like this, um, via a community member who's passionate about the homes in the neighborhood, to us negotiating an additional subsidy from the city for us to paint the house of the adjacent structure so that it matches our final siding color. When the request for proposals was released for this project, no other developer wanted to submit a proposal because there's no way they would turn a profit on rebuilding the other half of the single family home. And in fact, that's almost how we get all of our housing. Uh, we get what no one else wants. Our youth have had a tough life and so have our projects. Together, we, bring, we work to bring both of them back to their full potential as structures and competent human beings. In addition to our housing construction, we ask young people to take on projects that are different than what they might expect when they come to our program. One of our overall goals as an organization is to look at what efforts uh, that, and policy developments are, are happening around the city and bring those to the communities that we work at in, at a smaller scale. We're always asking ourselves, how can we make beautiful, equitable places without having to spend tons of money or leave the block that we grew up on? Uh, an example I'd like to give is a living roof bus shelter initiative, which I hear Anne might be working on something similar in New Orleans. Uh, after Superstorm Sandy in 2012, Boston took a more serious look at its infrastructure and ability to be ready for more deadly storms in the future, especially as oceans continue to rise. Uh, as various proposals started to emerge about what Boston's coastal neighborhoods might look like in the future, like East Boston or, or South Boston, the seaport, um, downtown, uh, I thought I'd do a litmus test with young people around Dorchester and Roxbury, see if they recognize the renderings of potential future Boston. And these are beautiful renderings. There's a lot of work that was that was going into this stuff. And I, so I really wanted to see you know, how did people relate to what's starting to pop up in terms of future, you know, Boston design. Uh, so as I showed in these photos, no one knew that this was actually Boston. I said, you know, where is this? Has anyone recognized this? Um, youth didn't recognize it. Their parents and other adults on the street didn't recognize it. And although most people thought they were images, uh, future, you know, suburbs of Dubai or something like that, no one really thought that this was Boston or didn't feel or look like Boston. So as this became a regular occurrence, I started to ask myself two questions. First, if this is what the future of downtown Boston might look like, uh, who is the workforce who's going to build it? If this was to start happening to get built tomorrow, we'd have to fly in a workforce because no one here has ever done anything like this in the, in the area. Secondly, how do these designs impact people in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, or the ones that are just in you know, the neighborhoods that are outside of just the coastal, immediate coastal area? Uh, how can we have conversations about resiliency in our neighborhoods that include social and economic equity? And what can we build that will be fun and good to look at when we're done? So the first person I call when, uh, when it comes to anything dealing with built infrastructure is my main man, Trevor Smith. Um, he's been doing resiliency work for years, and he has a passion for educating and training the next generation of the green infrastructure workforce. Together, we cooked up the Living Roof Bus Shelter Initiative as a way to talk about resiliency on the street. Since we didn't have any funding, Trevor agreed and his company agreed to cover the cost of materials and labor for our pilot project. And I worked with the MBTA in the city of Boston to get permission to install these green roofs along with creating a, a crew at Youthville Boston to train and do the work. If you ever watch Shark Tank, this is our proof of concept stage. Uh, so we installed green roofs on three bus shelters, maintained them for the spring, summer, and fall by watering and weeding them. And we took temperature checks with an infrared gun to compare the temperature of the roof to the sidewalk below to see, you know, to learn a little bit more about what heat island effect was. So the kids could kind of talk about that and also talk a little bit about the impact we're making. The pilot caught the intention of the Environmental Protection Agency in the, of the New England uh, region that we're in. And uh, we ended up writing and getting a grant to cover the costs of installation and maintenance for another year. Uh, they were excited about the project and even offered to contribute their time and energy to design a poster that would go on the inside of the bus shelter for those who were waiting under the roof. Uh, this was actually the day that we were installing our first bus shelter through the EPA grant. And it started pouring rain that morning before people started showing up. And I wanted to snap a photo because I was like, this is actually a perfect example of all the hardscape everywhere. Uh, there's a little patch of grass on the right here in that person's yard across the street. And that's about it. And so, you know, putting these green roofs on these bus shelters is a great way to talk about what is resiliency, not just on the coast, but in their inner cities. Um, so I, I really like that it happened to rain that day. Um, we installed uh, roofs on eight different bus shelters and once again did workshops and training events where we talked about how small projects like this are needed across the city to prepare Boston's future plans of resiliency and the workforce. You know, again, these are people who can potentially actually be doing these big things in 10 years, 15 years as real projects start to come through the system. Um, 
as the project started to gain more attention, we started to convince the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, the MBTA, that this would be a worthwhile investment on their end because of number one, it was good press, but it's also creating job opportunities for our youth and hopefully a pathway into jobs on working in, on the MBTA's uh, infrastructure projects. So what happened? Well, tough decisions happened. Uh, they offered us $80,000 to install green roofs on another 15 bus shelters the following year. So we were excited, we were dancing around, right? We're super happy. And then we said, okay, great, let's get into the details. So how much will our annual budget be moving forward for maintenance? And are you good with us leaving up the green roofs over the winter since our structural engineer showed us that the lightweight design wouldn't impact the structural integrity of these shelters? They said, well, there's actually no annual maintenance budget. So that's, you're gonna have to figure that part out. Uh, and you have to bring these down every winter and store them somewhere else, you know, so you have to take care of that, that part too, but we'll give you that initial cost. Uh, so then we started crying, um, you know, because this is, you know, that always the issue that comes up, right? So uh, we understood how their budgets work and we knew that the MBTA was already strapped for money behind on and, and behind on other projects. So we had to say no to the $80,000 because we just couldn't keep up the long-term maintenance and care of these projects. Now, how often do you see a community project that ends up like that, right? You get the big dose of money up front. It looks amazing for a year or two. And then the maintenance kicks in. And all of a sudden, they have that space or object like an eyesore and people complain about it. So we had been down that road before. And we declined to you know, move the project further and, sh further and shifted our attention elsewhere. Um, so since that time, we've actually continued to explore resiliency and how social and economic equity is a direct part of a, fully, you know, a truly resilient city. Examples include contracts with the Boston Parks Department, installing and maintaining their rain gardens, uh, working with local nonprofits like Haley House and the Urban Farming Institute to renovate and improve their uh, food growing areas as they continue to play a larger role in Boston's ability to grow its own food and so much more. So along the way, our staff and youth continue to try and drive policy that will help them get jobs that pay a livable wage, that provides leadership opportunities for our youth that can help them down the road wherever they go, and as well as get back to the communities as they come from and they feel like making a difference because they are. Every day we are challenged to find ways to pay for the work we do, to find allies and advocates in the private and public sector, and to drive home the fact that the health of a community is the health of its youth. And again, I'll remind that youth is that entire age group that we're talking about from you know, middle school all the way up through college. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you all again for inviting me to be part of this conversation and we can, we can have some chats now. <laughs> I'll stop my share. Um, I, I've got a question for Anne. Thank you so much, Michael. That was really great and awesome to see. I'm so curious about that half house. Um, but my question to Anne is like, I see your job as like and this amazing dream job that can be so fulfilling and rewarding. Um, but also, I mean, you you do so much and it's so busy. And I'm wondering if like that you have similar problems with um, balancing and mitigating burnout and how that functions. Cause to me, like, I feel very rewarded from what I do and look at you and I think it's a level up, but it also probably comes with a cost or two. I wanna say we didn't plan any of these questions. And so I didn't expect that question. I just wanna put that out there to everyone. Um, I feel like that's, I think it's a question for all of us actually is like the balance of, of this work, Julian, I know you and I have talked about like what it meant to volunteer with transitional spaces and what an amazing opportunity, like what an amazing kind of pivotal experience that was um, and is for you, you know, like that's been a defining moment and a, or a defining chapter of your, your existence, I guess I would say. And I think, um, I think I look at everyone on the panel and think that they have a dream job in some way or another, but I think there are always challenges of trying to figure out how to do, um, I don't know, I think there's always challenges of when you're doing this work to like remember why you're like, why you're doing it and holding true to that. It's easy to get caught up in the noise, I guess I would say. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I found like, I love this work because we get to engage with people and, and, and be like talking to people in person. That's like part of why it doesn't even feel like work, right? It's like part of who I am is like the connections. And I've found the last year to be really challenging um, when it comes to having so much of our life to be through these virtual frames. You can see, I talk with my hands, right? Like, I feel like I don't come across. So that's how I'll answer your question. 
uh, Julian. How about if I flip it to Michael? Um, Michael, with the work that you've been, like, let's stick with this idea of, um, of how has this work this year shifted or changed? Um, I imagine with design build, like you saw the images of our students with masks because we are back in person, but I'm wondering how your work has changed this year and how do you imagine, do you imagine it changing moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question because the pandemic definitely threw everyone for a loop, especially those of us who are used to working together all the time, right? So. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we kind of had to take a pause back in March when everything really shut down for a period of time, really figure out like everybody else is how do we how do we keep this thing going. Luckily, you know, being in the field of construction and, and really doing a lot of those outdoor types of projects, mm -hmm. we were able to kind of quickly transition to say, how can we keep doing outdoor work, um, public infrastructure types of projects, you know, working with these urban farms and others um, to do projects that we continue to be outside and social distance and do all of that, but continue to train. So I think a lot of what we ended up having to do was, um, you know, create COVID related policies about how basic things like sharing tools and being able to have team meetings and how do we do check-ins in the morning and all that kind of stuff. So we ended up having to really do a deeper dive into, uh, uh, you know, how we do uh, interactions with one another, but luckily we're outside and we were able to, uh, you know, continue to do work together in that sense. So I think, and oddly enough, uh, no one's had any sick days, you know, for the past six months or so, because no one's touching each other. There's no flu, there's no cold. So it's actually kind of interesting to see that in many ways, a lot of us have been more healthy in general because no one's interacting in the yeah. traditional way. So we're so we're, we're figuring it out, but we are still out there and we're still working and, and, and we've been building sheds all over the place and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so we're, we're, we're keeping it going. What, what did each of you do before you uh, started doing uh, your current work? <laughs> I'm going on mute and letting everyone else. <laughs> I guess I can quickly start. Uh, so I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, you know, I actually spent a lot of my initial years doing more community-based type of work, uh, community activism type of things, uh, you know, um, immigrant rights kind of work, that kind of thing. But I went to school for design and I really liked the academics of design. I really liked the kind of community engagement of what I was doing, in, you know, out on the street. And so I came to Boston to go to the BAC to put those two things together. and. I did that and that's kind of what I'm doing now. I feel like, you know, I'm a registered architect now, but I'm still able to get out there and, and do work that I prefer. So I see architecture as my tool for trying to solve bigger issues. Um, the short answer is a little bit of everything, um, but New Orleans, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of different things. So I was part of a community print shop I do a lot of work financially, um, film work, set deck, that kind of stuff. I also have a print production, a fine art print production with a partner that I've ran for seven years. Um, walk my dogs. And you're in school now. You want to say oh, that, Julie? Yeah, I'm going to RISD right now for uh, a master's in industrial design, which means I have to leave New Orleans next week, which I'm very sad about. So, so all of you studied design, but none of you had studied like development and, and landscape architecture or anything like that. I, uh, and I actually am not a designer by training. And so that is one of the interesting things, um, about leading a design center, not as a designer, um, but I found my way uh, in, I have a public health and environmental studies and environmental policy, but, but environmental science background. So in that way, like tied to landscape. And I always say that if I had known what landscape architecture was when I was going to school, I actually would have studied landscape architecture. It's like the place where policy and nature and people and all of it to me makes sense. It's like the social political economy, all at, all at that scale. Um, but uh, it's interesting not being a designer. I got into this space really um, uh, in um, like a little bit in grad school in public health um, in an international context, but then in the post Katrina New Orleans um, moment where I came back to the city and just like this was my had become my adult home and felt like I needed to be here. So I ended up in design. Um, in a very strange way. And I've also like Julian, I feel like New Orleans is a place where 
if you want to stay in the city, um, if you're not, I'm not from here, I'm a long-term transplant, like you have to reinvent yourself to stay. It's sort of the, the, I, I, I would say for those of us, like, yeah, if you're, if you're, you have to kind of reinvent yourself professionally always to try to stay. Hmm. I, I think along those lines today, I, you know, one of the questions I had was a little bit about that uh, organic and like over architecting, right? And I think this, I, I really love this, this project at Parasite because it started off with, you know, skaters doing their thing, right? That you guys were kind of guerrilla design and you were doing what you did out there that got bulldozed. And then you went to uh, get some support from, you know, designers, right? Like people who have design backgrounds to help put that together. How do you try to balance that, that, that part of the organic kind of, this is, you know, our piece here with the, with the design component that, so that it's not necessarily like, again, over design per se, um, but it's still, you know, so that it reflects what the needs are, but also still has the component that allows it to become legal or allows the city to recognize the fact that this is a legit park and that it should be there. I think like you and your projects, we have a lot of time to think. Like our permitting is crazy because it's state, well, it's local, but it's also state and federal department of transportation and they don't know what they're looking at and um, things move slowly. So our first couple builds were in response to one another trying to build outwards. Um, and I think it's just a matter of trying to get things to address different stakeholders. And that's also like, there's certain things that we can do that are somewhat under the radar, which makes a big difference. Like we just did a smaller fundraising to build a bunch of ledges that are movable by pallet jack. So they're permanent infrastructure, but they're also movable. And that's kind of a nice workaround. Um, can, I, can I just ask one question back at you, Michael? Um, I th looking at what you're doing, I think really ties in to what both Anne and myself are doing with working with a community and what really kind of struck me which was so interesting was like the futuring of Boston and I'm wondering beyond the physical construction skills like how that ties into youth build NOLA this idea of teaching people to like think laterally and to feel that they have a idea of how to get these things done yeah that's a great question um you know I, I think we try to we try to that's something we think about all the time, right? And one, one thing we, we try to do is just say, the power is in your hands. So how do we, how do we help you recognize that part of it? Because I think that, I think we probably teach less about um, construction skills or you know, that kind of thing and, and more about the ability to have people engage and have conversations that allows them to share ideas and then be comfortable being confident and asking good questions and things like that. So you know, one, of the, one of the quotes that we recently received from one of our graduates was that, you know, uh, we were building a shed for a nonprofit partner and they said that although the shed was really fun to build and they learned a lot there, they actually learned a lot more discussing things just in general that's going on in the world while building the shed and that that was the most valuable experience that that young person had while doing that shed project. And I think oftentimes we think of ourselves as our projects are like the water coolers of an office and that's the place that, you know, exchanges happened, you know, things, what did you do yesterday? How was your weekend? And or you hear about the thing that happened in DC, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that kind of stuff, right? So there's these big conversations that can happen. So for the best thing I think that we've been able to do is really have, you know, allow a, a, a place of safety and comfort that people can have real conversations with each other. And that's really what allows someone to then feel like, okay, I do have a voice and I can bring that out to then really deal with these bigger issues at hand. And sometimes it's just a ability to try and help people, you know, get that voice out. I wanted to ask a logistical question though, yeah. Michael, that was a great answer and I wanna like keep going. I wanna make sure we have time for uh, the audience questions. And I'm also seeing, um, uh, I'm also seeing on like there's some Q and A and so I didn't know if I should answer them in the chat or if we wanted to bring them up. So I just wanted to stop right there and I'll leave that uh, to everyone else. We can see the Q&A and, and if you um, see a question that you want to uh, jump into answering, you should go for it. Uh, and it is a reminder that uh, there's a Q&A box 
and we will get to uh, as many of the questions as we can. I mean, the first one that came in, which which relates to uh, what you were all saying, is about um, whether there is um, a, a larger discussion that's going on around infrastructure, um, and and uh, whether there are any plans to look more critically at infrastructure and the the intersections of infrastructure and our cities, and that's a, like a real big question, and I'm not quite sure of who it's addressed to. I mean, the basic answer is yes, um, but then what does that yes mean, right? There are engineers looking at it, there are planners looking at it. Um, as far as we know, there are going to be hundreds of millions of dollars spent over these next couple of years to improve infrastructure. And, you know, some of that's going to be about like resilience and sustainability, but some of it's going to be about improving school buildings or improving health centers or improving uh, transit systems. So how are you folks involved with thinking about those bigger questions, both of infrastructure and how infrastructure helps or destroys cities, and also how do you get young people to think about that, which is a big question that Michael raised. You can show a lot of pictures and, and people don't even recognize their own neighborhoods because of the way they're drawn, right? So what are the conversations you're having about infrastructure and, and how do you involve young people with that? Michael, you want to go sure. first? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think infrastructure is interesting because oftentimes when we're talking to our young people, we're we you know we're talking about. I think when we think about infrastructure, we're thinking like you know like you said resiliency type of things, right? We're thinking like sewer lines and stormwater infrastructure and that kind of stuff. And oftentimes, what what ends up coming up are are infrastructure that people kind of use a little bit that they can see more physically day to day. So I'm, I'm talking about like bike rental, you know, like the kinds of like blue bikes that we have here in Boston that you can, you know, get a, to take a quarter to take a bike somewhere. And oftentimes they're like, well, yeah, but where those bikes where I can drop them off at are like downtown somewhere, I can't ride to the grocery store. So there's an infrastructure about, you know, transportation from my house to a grocery store or infrastructure about what is, how far do I have to go to get to a bank? Or, you know, what does my street look like when it does flood and there's, you know, things coming, you know, sewer line coming up and stuff like that, right? So it's interesting to hear that there's a whole bunch of layers of infrastructure that we're, that we're looking at. And so it's not only necessarily about, again, the kind of the stormwater things that we're seeing in those big images that we saw, you know, earlier in, in my presentation, but it's also about like, how do I just get from my door to the bus and then from the bus to the train and then from the train to where I need to get to from there, right? Um, there's there's that kind of infrastructure along with food infrastructure. Uh, the pandemic has oddly enough hit a lot of grocery stores uh, hard because, um, you know, with the, the lack of restaurants being open now, the supply chains of all those food trucks that have been going to typically restaurants and grocery stores are now trying to reorganize themselves so that they can say, well, maybe we go to grocery stores. And so I've noticed that a lot of people have told me in various inner, inner city communities that you know have smaller grocery stores that their typical groceries aren't there. They have to go to the bigger grocery stores to get things. So that's an infrastructure. So we're just kind of, we're, we're looking at a lot about, you know, again, what's the social and economic components of, of what we're talking about here in addition to, you know, making sure that we don't, you know, get flooded when, when the next storm comes. In many ways, I think it's like the conversation of little A and big A architecture. I think there's sometimes a conversation about big I infrastructure and then little I infrastructure. They're all like they all have value and are, are as important as each other. And I think, Michael, what you highlighted is what we find too in a lot of our work um, uh, when we work in conversations about infrastructure end up being about streets and bus stops. And then, then it's tying to larger conversations about stormwater management because it's street flooding. It's, it's the flooding that happens on the front, uh, like on your block that you're talking about. And then that ties to our larger conversation. Uh, one of the things that we uh, tried to do, uh, and this is highlighted a lot, a lot of the projects we talk about are, are small scale. Well, Parasite for us is a big project, but for most people, it's a small scale project. But our projects are small in scale. Um, but we decided um, about five years ago now to develop public programming and outreach and an exhibit uh, um, yeah, really public program and outreach that's just important as all of our quote unquote kind of physical, more traditional design work. And that's really where we start to engage in these larger questions about infrastructure tearing. Let's hope that 
I'll just put my politics out there. I hope some of this new funding means maybe tearing down interstates. It looks like that might be the case. So um, there might be some resources for us to think about doing that. But we use public programming and outreach um, for both uh, um, uh, to have these larger conversations about infrastructure. At the same time, many of the photos you saw in the slideshow that we showed um, were taken by a staff member at the small center named Jose Cato. He also did the video um, and he's very talented and he right now is working on a project documenting Central City, the neighborhood we're based in. And part of that is an infrastructure conversation as well because he's talking to he's talking to everyone in the neighborhood and or talking to people in the neighborhood and also taking photos and just the small things that make a neighborhood, I think, are the infrastructure as well. So just like Michael said, but that's how we kind of engage with those larger and small questions at the same time. I can uh, briefly touch on it from not a bureaucratic standpoint, I guess. I mean, Parasite, unfortunately, is at capacity. Like, we still need to build out our park. But cities the size of New Orleans typically have, like, three to seven parks. And our biggest challenge is, like, access to transfer transportation. How do people on the West Bank or New Orleans East and all these places get parks? And still, a couple more parks have, like, arisen in the area, but still there's really not that many, but there's been a lot more DIY park models that have happened in the past year, which I'm not condoning, but I'm very happy exist. Um, and then beyond that, like, I feel like things like community fridges that are starting to pop out are creating their own infrastructure and fostering community, like human connection or connectedness at a time that's it's not really present in other ways with the pandemic. And we've had some community art, like libraries and art material spaces pop up along with community fridges here. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on um, what the center is at Tulane when, what how it came into being and, and what it does? And, and as you do that, um, you might also talk about uh, similar centers that have, um, come up around design schools in particular. One of the questions that came in was around uh, the rural studio in um, uh, Alabama. And, and you might talk about that and, and how uh, the, the professor there used things like big old truck tires to build houses for people. So how does that work? Absolutely. So we are the small center, the Albert and Tina Small Center for Collaborative Design. Um, we were formerly known as the Tulane City Center. Is the, uh, we're the community design center of the School of Architecture. And we're unique uh, in the way that a number of community design centers um, in the country that are based at universities often have one or the other of what we do. So we're embedded in the curriculum at the School of Architecture, much like the Auburn model or the rural studio model. So the rural studio is embedded in the curriculum of Auburn and they are not in, um, uh, they're of course in a more rural, they're in a rural area. Um, I think it's three hours away from, from the main campus um, and embedded there uh, where we also are embedded in the community that we, um, where our university is and our work um, and we have an outward face and we have a physical space um, that includes, uh, so the work is um, both the education and the curriculum piece, and we embed all the community work in that, but we have a very community outward face as well, um, and have a request for proposal process where most of our work comes from. And so equity, I didn't talk a lot about that, but equity is a driver kind of of all of our work on many levels, and that's embracing, um, that's everything from the way we get our projects and the way we select our projects to material choice we're asking um, kind of specific questions about that. And the center was founded just prior to Hurricane Katrina. And the scale of work we do is really a result of the post-Katrina 
experience of being planned and designed and architect on. Um, and many, many people in New Orleans spent hours and hours at meetings and saw nothing come of it. And so we've been really focused on these tangible projects, um, design, build, visioning, even the work we're doing now with architecture firms is very much about how can we support you in building capacity in your firm to be a better engagement you know, to do better engagement, not us doing the engagement for you. Um, and so I think those are like key components, just action, tangible items. And I, um, in terms of Auburn, um, I just wanted to say uh, the rural studio, like, of course, that was one of the models that we looked at. Uh, the Detroit Design Collaborative is another model, longstanding model uh, that has more recently got embedded in the curriculum and actually got a physical space in part um, they were inspired by us getting a physical space and that was in the works, but I think that helped them get a physical space close to the University of Detroit Mercy. Um, and then there's another community design center at the University of Hawaii uh, that has functioned differently, um, has gotten um, a lot of projects from uh, government um, that has funded our funded their our, or has supported their work. And that's where many of their projects come from, um, where most of our projects in the past have come in from nonprofit organizations. Um, and we've just sort of only started expanding to really doing work for city agencies. And then if I remember correctly, Sorry, I don't early know. on, um, uh, the, the uh, structure of your program was such that it didn't involve just students and faculty. I mean, I, I seem to remember that, oh. that the guy who ran your wood shop um, was, was part of the team that was working with students um, out in the community. Yeah, so I should say a key success, I should have said this first, sorry. Um, a key reason that we can do the work we do is we have staff. Like this isn't possible if we were just, if, we're not, if it was just faculty and students, none of this is possible without staff. I would, if anyone's thinking about a community design center out there based at an institution, it can't be uh, just faculty and students because faculty have their own other pressures as anyone who's on the call who might be a faculty member know whether they be a professor of practice like me or tenured like, and we work on a semester basis. None of these projects are semester long. And so I think um, having key staff make a big difference. Ted, thank you for bringing that up. We have, we have staff. I think, you know, just like us chalking it out, there's one thing to do paper architecture and another thing to actually get out there and pour the concrete and build the things. And um, I think it makes you a better designer, especially when you're able to do this with a community, but with different community projects to have to take into different considerations. So you're not designing for yourself, you're designing with people um, and welding and pouring concrete and doing all the other stuff too. Yeah, so, we find, like, oops, sorry. I was just gonna say, like yeah. we find at least from the surveys we've done that like students leave with a much more um, uh, like just uh, confidence in themselves in particular for our female, like our, our female students, the idea of construction and they head into firms um, more confident in their ability to take leadership roles. and the data that we've collected kind of play that out, so. So this goes for all of you and, and, and particularly I think for Michael, what, what are the challenges of working with young people uh, doing this kind of work that so often is done by uh, older professionals? Yeah, there's, it's, there's a, it's always a challenge, right? I think, I, I, I honestly think one of the, the things that people enjoy the most is that hands-on piece uh, and that, because, you know, again, even if you don't know what you're doing, we're all in the same boat together. We're all trying to figure it out together. And this is true too, for like corporate sponsors who call us up and say, Hey, we want to do a one day service event with you. Can we partner up with you and do a project? And so they'll come out with their account managers and that kind of thing. We'll partner them uh, with our youth and we'll all be together in the room, you know, out in the site somewhere and, and doing projects and, and everyone's kind of learning on learning how to do it together, but they're having those conversations. So what, what the youth oftentimes get the most pleasure in is the actual project work that they're doing. And, and, and that, that helps us then do all the other serious stuff, I guess you could say. <laughs> and 
why did you decide to take seriously a skate park rather than something else? I mean, it, I think a lot of people in the city will understand uh, why you might design bus shelters, right. um, you know, because they seem so functional, you know, and, and, and useful. But why a skate park? So we have a selection process uh, that um, that a jury of past par past community partners, um, architects, uh, now students, past students, um, that we use. I didn't put this. I took that slide out. But we actually have a score sheet where we have this RFP jury that chooses projects that I that. Um, that get at the structural issues that our city is facing and that's part of how they're ranked and transitional spaces in the skate park was a project we we take the top three and then we go out and interview people that's how we do it now but when um, when transitional spaces applied it was the top the top came out of the jury and they said this is the most important thing we can do at this moment um, and it's a project that we could take on and so just to say that we have a process in place that we use to get all these ideas and then have a jury uh, take a look at them um, and help us decide what we think we should work on and I think what you see in this project is the power of the project to bring people together and the thing that the jury highlighted of course was like here's a space underneath an interstate not used um, or and that, that there's an organization that already wants to make this work. It's a powerful place to bring people together. And so as Julian said, you know, one of the challenges is bus uh, getting there or getting anywhere in New Orleans, the bus, <laughs> bus transportation is a challenge, but, but we saw it people were coming from all over the city to skate there, even before Parasite came. And I think uh, that really resonated with the, the jury. Yeah, I, I remember going to a skate park, uh, uh, not to use it, but uh, to kind of check it out um, in uh, Charlestown a year or two ago um, uh, here in Boston. And um, there were some young people who had come up from Providence to use it because they didn't have uh, a skate park that was uh, convenient. Um, and it was worth their while to, uh, to come all the way, you know, nearly an hour away to, to get to use a skate park. What are the other kinds of things that you find young people asking for when they're designing and building? What, what, what do they see in their future of design and building and, and improving the quality in, in the cities? I guess I can start there. Um, oddly enough, I think once someone feels the confidence to do something with their hands or do something with a tool, then they see how they can apply that to a whole range of other things as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of people who come through the program, not all of them go into construction, a lot of them go into a whole bunch of other things, but just the capacity to say, oh, I, I did that, or they can drive by or walk by or ride their bike by some home that they worked on or a garden that they built or a raised bed that they built just the kind of confidence to say, I that I kind of left my mark on, in my neighborhood, then it, you know, kind of expands that ability for them to want to go and do a whole bunch of other things. So oftentimes, I, you know, that we, just that ability to do something physical and to leave that imprint, uh, to leave your fingerprint in that way, allows them to do then a whole bunch of other things. And so uh, it's just been interesting to see that kind of growth just to do that. So we provide the tools and the, and the place and you know, they then come out and have fun with it. And, and uh, again, that's how they learn about some of these other things. And you asked me earlier about, you know, uh, how, do, how do you get youth involved? And once they see that a bus shelter can talk about habitat and bees and stormwater and, and heat island effects and all these other things, it's kind of like, oh, this little, this little thing here did that, right? And that's true for all the other projects they work on. And then they think that way that, and it's more about how, what's your, what's your uh, 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 process of thought if I was gonna go to be a, a technician over here or administrator over there, right? So it's more about how do you solve problems than anything else. And I wanna have this great question and I'm gonna ask it to Julian um, is in the box. So thank you for this. It says, um, with these opportunistic projects, um, which I'm gonna put Parasite in, is it better for you to act first and ask for permission from regulators or is it more productive to work early on with regulators? And I'm asking you that Julian, because I think like we can have a productive conversation about like where you are and what you think about that um, now and the past and all of that. 
I can, you know, only speak from my experience. And I think a lot of New Orleans runs on an ask for forgiveness model. And I can't say if that's an asset or a detriment. Um, I wish it was, I wish the city had money to invest in certain infrastructures that people want, but if I, bureaucracy just stifles me to just think about. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to answer this question, <laughs> but um, here typically I think things that get a lot of traction are stuff that have action potential when you are working from an ask for forgiveness model. So you have a community of people that you enjoy working with um, and that kind of helps give something enough momentum and traction to get off the ground. And I think Julian, for us, it like when you came to us, it was a moment where like the ask for forgiveness later wasn't working. And, you know, there was this moment where it was like, it was no longer going to work. So I think, um, there was a moment where we could use, like, I think we always talk about building, like elevating and building power. And part of sometimes building power is actually transferring like the legitimacy of an entity like the small center or the umbrella of Tulane. Um, I think that's a space where we were able to say, okay, this is a moment where like what has been working won't work anymore, won't work in this context. So how can we like work with you to build capacity so we can navigate what is required to make this legit, you know, quote unquote legitimate in the eyes of the city so it can continue to exist. And, you know, beyond just the interacting with the small center, um, Capital Projects Administration, New Orleans Capital Projects Administration was willing to work with us and take a chance on us. They had no reason to let us exist. We were a bunch of people illegally building on land that wasn't even theirs, but was definitely seen as a liability. So their ability to give us a shake is, you know, speaks to their capacity and speaks to the benefit of, I think, willing to take chances um, and being able to see one another as equals or see the potential in collaboration. Who, who usually um, negotiates and does the navigation through all of these bureaucracies for you in all cases? On my end, it's me. I don't know, but it sounds probably Julian is on your... <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, a lot of my job is, is trying to navigate all of that while at the same time trying to figure out how we do the, you know, the kind of curriculum or what, what are we trying to accomplish here? And then how do we then um, use the language that sounds like Julian said, that sounds sexy to the, anyone who's got to listen to that, to approve it, right? How do we make it work for them so that it also works for us? Everyone's going to kind of win. So a lot of it's a little bit about making that deal and trying to figure out how to make it work without anyone feeling liable. And that's always the biggest issue at the end of the day is I don't want to be liable for this. If something happens, it's on you guys. Right. So, um, so that's usually how we have to spend time figuring that out. And how did you figure out how to do that? Uh, well, uh, luckily for us, we are a you know a general contractor, and we do our, our students actually do have are covered under a workers' comp on our on our during program with us. So luckily, when whether they're doing raised beds or building a house, they are you know we, we have liability of them uh, insurance wise, and so that's also an attractive way for people to work with us because they do realize that we can try and test some things without them feeling like there's a risk to it. So. Uh, so that's something that we take on ourselves to make sure we're doing properly. And that's why we also have to be very safe whenever we're doing whatever we're doing. Mm. And, and for all of you, what does success feel like? And then I'll give you a hint of what the next question is, which is... Um, what is failure? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what sort of stuff hasn't worked for you, right? Because we, you know, we all tend to learn more from the stuff that doesn't work than for the stuff from the stuff that does. Um, if it works, you're just happy that it worked and you don't always go back and question why it worked. But if it doesn't work, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make it better. So what's the stuff that doesn't work? 
and then when stuff does work, what what what's your measure of success? Sure, I can start. Uh, so uh, you've been here a long time, Ted. I mean, you know Boston. You've this is your this is your town here. Uh, I, the one of the things that I think the hardest part that we constantly are are, are trying to change is policy. Um, you know, at the end of the day, our projects that we do are, are those are short term successes. Those are battles that we win to show how this works, how that works and how this works. Right. But if we if, if that doesn't if there's not an outcome at the end of a changed policy that allows those particular things to be improved or to have a process for someone like a, a young person to be able to get involved either politically or in a job or whatever, then it's it those are the ones that you, you have to keep grinding over and over and, and for years. And that's work that has to be done over years and years and years, right? It's not that short-term installation. It's how do you change the way that people think and the, and the system behind it? So, so for us, that's that, you know, the, the successes are those short-term term wins and showing people that something can work. The, I wouldn't say the failure, but the continued goal and the striving to continue getting somewhere is that when that policy is finally in place to say that this is now how we do this, that's, I think, the big, big success. And that's what we try to are constantly working to try and do every single day. Julian, I want you to go next and then I'll wrap up. Um, beyond just having really long standing and continuing relationships with both government entities and the small center, success is every day at the skate park when there's our population is continuing to grow. There's all these new roller skaters that are teaching younger roller skaters. Their diversity is continuing. There's like every day there's something that's magical that happens there. And that's kind of what keeps, it just keeps succeeding in that way. Um, I can't necessarily speak on failures as much as personal challenges or challenges. I think it's really a matter of patience and taking the long road. And in the past, I've had some catharsis through um, complaining to my co-director, but I think the proof is really in building infrastructure that can last, um, that people can use with one another. And I would guess I would say, I think the projects that are, um, or not even projects, um, the long game, the success to me is like an example, like Parasite that is continue, the organ is, it's not about the physical space. The physical space is working, right? Like it were, I mean, it's amazing. Like it's like, unlike any, I mean, if you go to other skate parks around the country, they do not look like Parasite. They don't, they don't have the same ethos. They don't have the same people. They don't like, it's, it's a very different skate park. And um, it's a park for skaters, not a skate park, right? As Ali said, um, from the get go. Um, and that, but it, it's the physical space, but it's the people. It's the fact that the organiz like transitional spaces, Julian and Skylar stepped away. Yeah, it took a long time, but it's still existing. And the park is still cleaned up. And to me, our long-term successes are when we, and we're doing some research now to try to understand if we're really accomplishing this, but like, are we building capacity and coalitions of organizations to address these issues and in and, and themselves as well? Like, are we connecting people across like power and race and economics and social issues? Like across all these divides that exist in our city, are we making it, are, are we doing something? And to me, that's success. Like if we're doing that, even in the short term, that has long-term implications, right? And so to me, that's where I like focus on success. Like we fail all the time. Um, like <laughs> I'm not gonna spin it in these positive ways <laughs> as everyone else has. Like, I mean, we have some projects like design build projects that feel over designed for the space. Like we butt up against the needs of students and the short-term um, desires of, of, uh, of project partners and the time that we have, the resources that we have. Um, Parasite is different, but the majority of our design builds are $15,000, right? And and so we butt up against those kind of issues. And we have some of like, some designs that I will say are, you know, that don't always work. We have projects that like, that come through the RFP process and then 
we have to step away from because the organization needs to do some of its own work that's happening right now with a project. And so, um, yeah, we fail all the time. Um, and we're always trying to navigate the power dynamics of Tulane and what Tulane is, which is not a school that's filled with New Orleanians or Louisianans. They're like, we're certainly trying to change that in some regards or some new funding available for Louisiana students. But in reality, like we're an institution that does not look like the city that we live and work in, right? It's predominantly white institution. And um, so we're always trying to navigate those, those power dynamics and um, we don't always succeed. We, you know, we keep trying, but we don't always succeed. Anne-Marie? I have a question just before we wrap up to follow up, given, you know, um, all of you talked about the desire to have a bigger impact, you know, through, through projects, through capacity building. If you were to offer guidance or counsel to, to the mayors, you know, the current or future mayors of your city or to people operating at that kind of level, what, what counsel might you offer them in terms of is helping to facilitate the change that you you envision. Uh, want me to go first again? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think what what we have been seeing, especially over the past say, ten years, uh, is that the more that that people collaborate, especially in the nonprofit sector, then the more successful people are in general. And it's exactly what Anne's trying to do is like, how do you kind of elevate each other? And so what do you do really well? What do you not do really well? And then how do you find the other people who are doing things that you're not doing well, very well, just partner up and do things rather than trying to do it all yourself. Uh, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, oftentimes nonprofits, especially in the nonprofit sector and in, in a city like Boston that's saturated with nonprofits, everyone's trying to, you're almost like, you know, certain ways, which is, is not a good thing. You're almost like trying to vie for that same demographic of student or that, that same money or whatever that is. Right. And in many ways that's, that's kind of taking away from the whole point of what you're trying to accomplish in the first place. So it's really more about saying, you know, here's something that we do special. We can collaborate with that person and that person because they're really good at those things. And let's think a little bit more about what, you know, tradition is called wraparound services. And how do we try to just think holistically about our approach to a, a problem in, at a bigger level and how that works. And so I think that, you know, from the government perspective, whether you're city councilor or mayor or anything else, you know, if we were to, you know, look from the top down, I think it's like, how do we, how can we have those fingers start to, to touch one another a little bit better and really start to connect the dots so that, you know, we can, that money can go further and people are, you know, are really collaborating at a, at a better level. That's really where those successes I think will happen. I mean, this might be plugging in a small center um, too hard, but I think as Ted touched on earlier, how do you navigate all the bureaucracy and governmental things for improving and getting traction and there are so many nonprofits and being able to help get different community members at play and different um, contributors to help navigate these things will help foster more, and more projects. So more centers like that, more money for those centers um, is power and collaboration. I think if there was a way to ease, this is, I don't know, I'm, I, I can't decide if I wanna be big or pragmatic and I'm never really good off the cuff at these bigger questions, I will say. Anne-Marie knows this about me, I kind of ramble in these situations, but but I think pragmatically, you know, if we could just lower barrier, like we could simplify and lower barriers of entry um, when it comes to these processes that we've purposely designed to make them difficult for certain people to access, right? Like we've designed these processes. They're part of the structural inequity that exists in our, in our country and the structural racism that exists in our country. And so if these processes, whether it be from permitting or access or navigation of this bureaucracy is made so difficult for a specific reason, it's just like infrastructure designed to divide, right? And so the more that we can think about how do we design different kinds of processes that are about access and openness and equity. Um, I think that 
that's the big thing. And, you know, the small like centers like us, and there's lots of things that fall under that gigantic big answer. But I think it's about thinking about what does it mean to look at the things that we truly have designed to reduce, to like, to really divide, limit all of those things that we've done. How do we look at those and say, how do we redesign these systems processes um, to create different cities? And part of that is like moving from a scarcity model, right? Like, what does that look like in the nonprofit sector? Like, we have all these nonprofits for a reason, like, and and how have they come about? They they're trying to meet needs, but they're competing in a scarcity model. And so it's it's like nonprofits have come into existence because the public sector <laughs> hasn't always worked. And so um, like how do we how do we start looking at the larger scale issues? That's what I would say, Anthony. I'm gonna stop. Well, thank you. I think that was a, a great uh, wrap up and also good prompt that I think for, for people who've been listening in on these sessions, we're really trying to, you know, weave those considerations into all the various topical discussions because it is, uh, you know, these, these, these issues that we're thinking about, and we're talking about are complex and it's not about any one single entity. And I think it is about coming up, uh, being able to foster collaboration and, and inclusion. Um, so, so thank you, Anne and Julian and Michael for tonight's conversation. It was really dynamic and I think everything we had hoped for um, this evening. And, uh, and we will be continuing the conversation about these issues. Our, our next conversation is gonna focus on housing and how we can think of housing as a way to advance uh, health and well-being. And we'll be uh, joined by uh, an urbanist, an architect, and a design innovation fellow to talk about similarly how we can address these issues on both an individual project scale as well as a citywide scale and how we promote conversation and dialogue between the various entities. So uh, I hope all of you can join us and thank you again to, to our panelists this evening. Ted, any other uh, thank, comments? Thank you very much. This has been great. And do it again. <laughs> Thanks. Good night. And uh, we'll see everyone next week. Take care.